All right. Uh, welcome everybody to, I think this is the fourth or fifth uh, tin can tutor, tutoring uh, session that we had. Most of the uh, first ones were in the spring and uh, Tim was involved in a couple of those as well, where he helped us uh, understand insurance uh, for vintage trailers. And um, those are all recorded and they're available on the Tin Can Tourist uh, website. Uh, if you can stay on mute uh, so we don't get uh, a lot of background noise. Um, and uh, when we get to the Q&A session section of this, which won't be long, that's this uh, we don't really have a presentation to go through, um, so it's going to be largely um, a Q and A with Tim. Uh, you can come off mute if you have a question. Uh, we're recording the event, so I'll make this available on the Tim Can Tourist website and send out um, the links to everybody posted on Facebook as well. Uh, we're grateful that you're spending um, your afternoon. Uh, with us. So thank you. And I'm really thankful that Tim is spending part of his rally time uh, with us as well. A uh, little bit about Tim Can Tourists. Some of you may not be members or might not know a lot about the club. Uh, the club turned 102 years old this year. It was established in 1919. Um, it kind of died out a little bit into the 70s and uh, my parents renewed it in 1998 as a all make and model vintage trailer club. I may be biased, but um, it is the oldest and best trailer club in the world. Uh, it doesn't matter how old of a trailer you have or how old you are or how big or small or what shape um, of the trailer that you bring. And Tim's trailer that's behind him is a, an example of that. Um, and it doesn't really matter if your trailer is professionally restored or if it's a barn find and you're bringing it to a rally. Matter of fact, most of the time barn finds are the most interesting trailers we see at rallies. Um, everyone is welcome to join our club and come camping with us. And the club uh, promotes the interests of all of our vintage trailers and motorhome owners. We work with campgrounds, uh, we work with companies that build make parts that you need like vintage trailer supply we work with vintage trailer restoration companies like Heinz designs um, historians and others that support our community and make sure that our the community is appropriately served a little bit about myself and Tim um, I'm a Royal Can opener of the Tin Can Tourist. I've uh, been doing that for the last three years. Um, Michelle, who's uh, you can um, online, she's muted. You might not be able to see her video. She's in the other room. Uh, we, uh, we both own a 1949 American Homecrest and a 1957 Avion Regal. Previous to being uh, can openers, um, we were the Mid-States Regional Representative for 20 years. We live in Northern Michigan near Houghton Lake, so if you're familiar with that. And Tim, we are about 90 minutes from Ellsworth, where your trailer was, was made. Um, Tim is the Southeast Regional Representative of our club, and he's the owner of Heinz Design. He's been collecting and restoring vintage uh, RVs and trailer coaches for 20 years, even though he looks like he's about 25. Um, he's the foremost expert uh, in vintage trailer history. Anybody that ever wants to identify what their trailer is goes on our Facebook group and asks Tim to do it for him. Uh, Tim's located in Panama City, Florida, but he's not there right now. So Tim, why don't you tell us where you're at and what you're doing this weekend? Sure. Uh, this weekend, we are about an hour uh, northwest of Panama City, Florida. We're having the Tin Can Tourist uh, Defuniac Springs, Florida rally. And we're at a great um, RV resort that's not far off the Interstate 10 called Twin Lakes Camp Resort. Um, highly recommended if you're traveling through. And they've been great with us for the rally. And the weather has been perfect, as you probably can see. <laughs> awesome. So uh, Tim uh, get, gets a lot of these questions 
um, regularly uh, Facebook or email and thought it would be good to do a session that we could record and make available for people. Um, so he, he, he's going to provide some tips and discuss the laws pertaining to vintage trailer tags, titles, and registrations. Um, that different topics that go with that are around serial numbers, bins, bills of sales, um, non-title states, registration, uh, weight laws, state definitions, and title jumping. So there's a lot here to kind of cover, but they're all uh, related. And as he mentioned, he's zooming in live from his rally. Um, at the end of the, the session, uh, we'll leave some time. And Tim uh, has a fresh, rest freshly restored uh, trailer behind him that he's going to give us a walk through and uh, if possible maybe we'll see a few of the other trailers that are uh, at the rally with them. Uh, so uh, so if you have a question, hopefully you do and the reason why you came here, you can take yourself off mute and ask the question. We'll try and get to have Tim get to as many questions as possible and leave some time for his walk through. And uh, Tim is not going to identify your trailer in this session. Maybe we'll just have a session uh, dedicated to that. So let me take uh, myself off of the screen share so we can see all of Tim and all of you when we go ahead and have questions. So who has, a, who has the first question for Tim? We're doing a live video. I'm sorry, but you can look in. It's fine. <laughs> All right, Tim. So I'll I'll start. So, um, why why is it that so many vintage trailers are purchased without a title? Well, a lot of trailers don't have titles because they were not required to have titles. Now, the part of that people will not go deeper into is that pretty much all states at least required a registration. So. If you are purchasing a trailer, you kind of need to make sure it has some sort of legal state issue paperwork, whether that is a title or at least a registration. Um, a lot of people get confused that a bill of sale is actually not a legal document in regards to the legality of the sale. It all it does is just provide a receipt. And some of the stuff I was going to talk about, you know, is more to do with the terminologies and the stuff that um, may help with tips. You know, I can't really tell everybody exact processes for every state, um, because every state does have different laws when it comes to vintage trailers. So there really is no one answer when people come to me and it's like, how do I register this vintage trailer? You know, it doesn't have the right paperwork. But what I want to lead with, there is one rule that will apply to all vintage trailers that are predate 1981, no matter what state you're living in or what state the trailer came from. And that is any trailer that is purchased that has at least a legal registration and or a legal title in the name of the person that's selling the trailer, that is the only guarantee you can have that you will have absolutely no issues into having that trailer transferred into your name, getting a legal title in your name or registration and a legal tag in your street legal. So the first thing we'll talk about is what a non-title state is. Uh, many people can say, you know, I bought this trailer or I'm going to buy this trailer, but the people I'm buying it from says that their state don't issue a title. Well, that may be true. The reason for, you know, me saying that you need to buy a vintage trailer with a title and or registration is that some states never issued a title for travel trailers they only issued your registration. And this is also common in most states when it comes to small utility trailers or small boat trailers, same thing. All you get is registration and you get a tag, but you never get a title. Now, if you live in a state that requires a title on a vintage trailer, for example, I'm a Florida resident, Florida does issue titles for all travel trailers. They started doing that in 1925. So Florida was one of the first states to issue travel trailer titles. Florida will recognize a legal registration from a non-title state, no different as a title. So for another example, Alabama, right across the state line, never issued titles for travel trailers until 1996. So if I buy a vintage trailer, which I do quite often from Alabama, 
I make sure that it at least has a legal registration. I bring it back to Florida. I take that registration that's signed by the seller and the buyer to the DMV. No questions are asked because Florida will recognize a state issue document. Now it is also advised to get a bill of sale and a little hint is always make sure that your bill of sale has some sort of sentence or clause where the buyer or excuse me, the seller is signing that says that the trailer is free, free of all liens. Some states that's a very important clause to have in the bill of sale because then the state realizes that the seller is stating by law that he acknowledges there are no liens on this trailer. And that may help you get the paperwork with no questions asked. So make sure it has a title or a registration that's gonna have no issues no matter where you live at. Now with a bill of sale, this is where a lot of people get confused too because they'll buy a vintage trailer with just a bill of sale. And like I said earlier, a bill of sale has no legal standing when it comes to the legality of the sale. It in no way guarantees that the buyer has the legal right to buy the trailer or the seller has the legal right to sell the trailer. It only records the transaction. Should anything come back that says, you know, hey, this trailer was stolen, the bill of sale is not going to save you because it does not say that the sale was legal. It's just saying, yes, you transferred a certain amount of money for a product. It doesn't say that that product was legal. So make sure you know your state laws when it comes to a bill of sale. That even means if it's notarized, if you go to the extent of having it notarized, that notary is not stating that the sale is legal. It's just stating that yes, that's your signal on the bill or signature on the bill of sale, and that's the seller's signature. Nothing else. Um, even when it comes to legal documents, a notary does not have to read the documents by law. They don't have to. All they are doing is saying yes, this is your signature and the other person's signature. So another thing we'll go and talk about is what we talk or call weight laws. And we are seeing this a lot posted on social media of if your vintage trailer weighs a certain amount, you don't need any paperwork. You don't need a title or you don't need a registration. You may even hear this from your local DMV clerk. And anytime you're dealing with a vintage trailer and you're dealing with a DMV, I highly suggest you ask for a supervisor. It's not the fault of the clerk, but there are so many state laws with every state. It's going to be impossible for the clerk to know every single definition in every single state law. And where this really gets confused is many states and pretty much every state I've looked up, which has been most of them, there's two different definitions. There's a definition of the terminology of trailer, and then there's a separate definition on the terminology that is travel trailer. Because here in Florida, I hear this all the time. I can take any vintage trailer under you know, 2,500 pounds and get a registration for it and I'm good. Well, that's true if you go into the DMV and say, I just need a trailer registration. Because the definition by Florida law and most other states, a trailer is anything that has no living space. A utility trailer, a boat trailer, cargo trailer, car hauler, any type of trailer like that is where that law takes into place. As soon as a travel trailer has any living space, it becomes a travel trailer by definition. And state law, just like here in Florida, says any travel trailer, regardless of the weight, must have a title. I've really been seeing that for um, Arkansas, Tennessee, and even Michigan. I've had a lot of people emailing me saying, no, you know, I went to the clerk or the, you know, the DOT or DMV, and the clerk told me if it weighs a certain amount, I don't have to have a title. I, somebody called me yesterday from Michigan and said, well, you know, they told me it weighs under 3,000. I don't need a registration. You go to the state website, pull it up. It, it is a little misleading, especially for Michigan, because it starts out with trailers under a certain weight don't need a title. But then if you read down in it, it says, but all travel trailers must have a title. So when you do go into your DMV office, they say something about the weight question them on it. Say, hey, can I talk to a supervisor and just confirm this? Um, this little trailer behind me, I had to go in and, you know, renew the tags on it before I brought it to this event. And the little DMV clerk that was behind the counter, she looked at me and she said, oh, well, how little is, you know, how much does an 11 foot travel trailer weigh? I said, well, I haven't had it weighed, but I know it weighs, you know, under 1500 pounds. And she said, well, then I need to destroy this title and just give you a registration. I said, no, you're not destroying this title I got. <laughs> I know the Florida laws and she kind of wanted to argue with me. So I said, you know, 
if you get your supervisor, because I didn't see her, I usually wave at her when I go in there. I said, I know she'll know who I am. I'm in here more than enough dealing with, you know, they call me the nightmare kid because I always have traders, trailers with three digit serial numbers and stuff like that. And I said, she'll know me. She'll know the laws. And sure enough, she came out and she said, no, he's right. If it's any travel trailer. So it may not be the fault, you know, it, it can get confusing with laws. So don't blame your DMV clerk, but question them because they may not know. Um, so double check. Early on when I got into the trailer restoration hobby, I had a little 68 Scotty. I didn't know these laws. I went in just like most people and said, I need a title for a trailer. DM, DMV clerk assumed I meant a utility trailer. It's only 13 foot. I didn't know better to question it back then. They issued me just a registration, gave me a tag. I was happy to go on my way. Well, then I get pulled over by a DOT officer because there had been a wreck up above and they, I guess maybe even got bored behind me and read my tag on my trailer. And it came up as a trailer tag, and not a travel trailer tag. And I actually did get cited and fined for having an incorrect registration. So make sure you have the right registration on your travel trailers because there can be fines and, and issues. I was very lucky that they were kind enough the officer was to let me come home and correct it because he said by law I can require you to pull over unhook from the trailer and you've got to leave it on the side of the road so you get it straightened out so it can cause some issues if you don't have the right, right registration on your trailer so and the um, the sorry just getting a little feedback um the just a second. The, so the advice about um, going to DMV and um, getting talking to a supervisor is a good one because it seems like um, what we what I've experienced and what we see on Facebook a lot is people saying well, go to a different DMV, right? Because um, that that person might not be aware or their supervisor might have better information. I think the same thing is true with asking this question on Facebook is um, don't just accept the answer you're hoping for, right? Because we see this a lot. People ask the question about how much does my trailer weigh or can I do these things? And they hope somebody will say yes, that somebody might not be right. You need to make sure that you're getting, you know, a majority of opinion or a qualified opinion um, to to make sure that you're you're legal and follow, following the rules, right? Um, and you know, try to try to go to a main if main DMV office if you've got more than one in your county because here in our county we've got like seven DMV offices and they're all a lot of small ones, but the main one is the one I go to because it has I think Florida calls it a lieutenant tax collector which is assistant and they're the ones that have all the books that they can pull out all these old laws and, and double check everything. Catherine has a question. Yes, so I'm in the process of buying, like I paid a deposit and I'm having um, a antique camper restored. And the, the title, it has a title, but the title has the wrong model. And so I'm on the fence, like we don't know what this trailer is. Like no idea what it is. It could be a homemade, titled as a Shasta, but it's probably not a Shasta and there's no marking anywhere. Should I just proceed with the title that I have? Is it gonna be probably the smoothest path or could it cause any problems? I would probably proceed with the title you have if it's not in your name. Go ahead and get it transferred in your name first. Yeah. Once you get it legally in your name, then you know, ask for a supervisor and say, hey, you know, this title doesn't have a model and it doesn't may not have the correct brand you know should i pursue this should i change it the the, the supervisor will be honest with you you know because honestly they may look at it as a nightmare that they don't want to deal with and they're just going to tell you <laughs> i mean there's with. nothing like we have no idea what this camper is it's cute sure. <laughs> it's cute and it's from the 50s probably right and as long like as long as the serial number or vin number on the title matches the trailer you know, at least, you know, that's the correct paperwork for that trailer. You know, a lot of times the databases, you know, the, the DMVs have to use database abbreviations. And some of these trailer brands were never put in the digital database. So it may even be if it does have an abbreviation where the brand is supposed to be on your title, it may be something that just was as close to possible. And that 
information may have been lost over time as it sold what it actually was. Uh, matter of fact, when I took this little Ellsworth in to have titled in Florida, there was absolutely no abbreviation in the computer system for an Ellsworth. I mean, <laughs> this is literally like the only one known to exist. So they kind of either had to make something up. Actually, I think what they did, they used another brand abbreviation that was like ELL. Mm -hmm. So it, that may be a situation in, in your case, but ask your supervisor and see if they recommend pursuing it or just kind of leaving it as is. Okay, I have so, one more. Well, I sure. have, I'm sorry. <laughs> no so, um, cause I'm getting this in a couple of weeks. So it's like, I'm very anxious about all this. So um, according to, I live in the state, um, in North Carolina and the state of North Carolina, I have to have it inspected. And I spoke to the people at the top office and they told me, but I don't believe them that any like place that does vehicle inspections can inspect it. Is that true? I'm sorry, you cut out on me. Any what? Oh, so, so I, the tax office in North Carolina told me that any location that does vehicle inspections can inspect a camper, but that sounds questionable to me. So, they're talking about any state like tag office. They told me I could go into my mechanic. Oh, and it may be true because in Florida, we don't do vehicle inspections. But in many states, they do, and any mechanic will have the actual paperwork to fill out. And it's going to be very, very simple stuff. Even it's not for going to a travel trailer? Yeah. I mean, it yeah. doesn't even have, I mean, it has nothing. I mean, it doesn't even have running water. Right. Some of the, some of the inspection items that they're probably just going to check is, do the running lights work? Does the axle look safe? Do the tires or rims look safe? Just the part that's important for pulling it, is it, is it safe? So it's not going to be like a full, like an inspection I would do at the shop for somebody that's looking to buy a trailer. It won't be something like that. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering, cause I, I thought that I had to take it to the DMV, but then they told me that I could just take it to any, which would be great because I could take it to my mechanic. Yeah, but... I would call, call, call your mechanic and see, Hey, you know, they said I could take it anywhere. Do you have the, the files or paperwork to fill out for an inspection? Okay. And then actually one more, I'm sorry. Sure. No I'm not trying to, to usurp the attention. Um, so also, as far as I know, like you're the insurance expert. So what companies, like I called Geico and they are straight up not happening because that's who I have my auto insurance through. And I also called a couple others and it sounded really sketchy and they would only insure it for the value of the year that it was built, which is obviously right. not... Yep. Don't go that route. I'll tell you about the only two insurance companies that I would have you call. There's a company called Farm and City Insurance out of Iowa. Okay. They're, they probably have written more insurance policies on vintage trailers than any other company out there. And then Haggerty is starting to write insurance. They're trying to get in all states. They're not in all states yet. I'm not sure if they're in your state yet, but give them a call. The only um, caution I would have you with Haggerty, they're a great company. The difference between the two is Farm and City requires an appraisal, which I like that idea that you've got a third party valuation should you have to file a claim. Haggerty is not requiring an appraisal, but Haggerty has told me and confirmed that if you as their client want to have an appraisal done, you can have it done, you can send it to your agent at Haggerty and they will put it in your file, which I highly recommend because that way if you get totaled or if you have to file a claim, it's not just your word against their word. You have a third party valuation to, to fight with. Now, what about like if you have, um, so, you know, this is, a, mine is a complete rebuild. So I have um, like, I have a contract that says everything that's being done for the camper. And then I'll have a bill of sale that states that it was a complete rebuild and the price. Can I can I use that bill of sale with the price as valuation or no? Most insurance companies are going to want an appraisal. Okay. And also, um, what about so you said these were the only two? Someone had also suggested um, in the past to me that AAA offered really good um, travel trailer insurance. Is that true or no? I don't know the, any specifics with AAA when it comes to vintage. Um, Haggerty and Farm and City are the two that I have experience with and that a lot of our clients use. And they're the ones that send clients to me for appraisals. So I kind of have a you know relationship with them that I'm, I can tell you they know exactly what they're doing. 
There are some other insurance companies out there, but a lot of them can vary by state. I know Progressive can vary by state as well as start State Farm. Um, if you contact another in agency for insurance, just make sure that they're understanding that you need an agreed upon value and that they're giving you an agreed upon value policy. Okay. Catherine, um, it, I think you would benefit if you go to the Tin Can Tourist website, we have multiple presentations on insurance, one done by Tim, which fully explains uh, all these topics and one done by Haggerty um, as well, the Haggerty rep that talks about their offering. So it'd be a good one for you to check out. Um, sure, uh, Tim, what are the downsides of having, like Catherine was saying, you know, she has a title but it might not have the right model or make or the right information. So what are the downsides of having um, kind of wrong information on your title registration that's being transferred or, um, or maybe let, let's just start with that and I'll have a follow up. Right. You know, with incorrect information on your title and or registration, it can affect the value and it can affect the sellability of the trailer because some people will get cautioned you know, very cautious about buying a trailer if they if they know exactly what the trailer is and the title's incorrect, then yeah, there it's gonna obviously raise some red flags. Um, but if it's something like a homemade trailer or it's questionable, like in her case, it may not affect it near as bad. But it's always best to have the correct information. And even if you know the correct information and it's wrong on the title, you know, ask your DMV, hey, you know, can I get it changed? You know, and if some of them may not change it because they don't have any proof, but not as advertisement, but my company does offer what we call year make and model confirmation documents that we will draft up and send to you that you can take to the DMV and say, look, here's a historian. Then, and a lot of times we have the facts to back up, like, especially if we have that particular make and models production number series that we can make a copy of and send to the document saying here, here's proof that this serial number series was used in this year. So that confirms with no, no doubt that this trailer is the correct year. And we, we do that for a lot of people and a lot of the DMVs are receptive to that. Okay, yeah, I think my follow-up was around kind of, you hear people who don't have the right information or don't get the right documentation from sellers. Um, and people will say, well, just go register it as a homemade. Um, so it sounds like all of those things that you just mentioned would be uh, complications if you went out and registered as a homemade trailer. It is. And many states have strict guidelines for doing homemade. You have to provide receipts of everything. So even if you bought a restored trailer that was, you know, a homemade or unknown, it's going to be hard to prove the value of it. And many states are going to look at it and, you know, if it looks commercially built, it's pretty obvious sometimes then they're just going to say, no, this is not a homemade or there's an existing serial number. You know, we can't, we can't title it because of this. So um, if you don't have proper titles registration, you didn't get things transferred over appropriately, um, what should or shouldn't you be doing with that trailer? <laughs> you know, my rule of thumb, just because it's a much more simpler life is if it doesn't have the title and registration really really rethink your choice of whether you should buy it unless you've already contacted your dmv especially a supervisor and said what are my options in this state some states are very very lax you know if it's not been registered in so long or if it's not in the database you know they may say as long as you buy a bonded title you know that you're saying you understand that you've got a bonded title for a certain amount of years. If somebody comes forth with proof that this is their trailer, you're going to turn it over to them. So there are some situations in some states you can do that, but not all states. Not all states will do that. Here in Florida, we do have some very strict title laws. Unfortunately, there is no process in the state of Florida that if you buy a travel trailer with a bill of sale that you can, you can get it legal because there's no way to prove that it's not stolen. There's no liens on it. And some DMVs will tell you that, oh, well, you can petition the court, you can go before a judge, you can have a judge say, yes, we'll issue a new VIN for it, get you a title. But in every case I've heard of that, you'll pay the expensive lawyer fees, you'll pay the court costs, you'll go in front of the judge, they'll look at it and say, what is your proof that it is not stolen? And when you can say nothing more than a bill of sale, 
that's just a receipt, then the judgment's going to be denied because there is no proof that it's not stolen. So really be cautious of a situation like that. And another kind of side to that is with the VIN numbers or serial numbers. Uh, we see that a lot online. People like, I just bought this trailer. I need to prove it is what it is or prove that it's legal. Where can I type in the serial number or the VIN number to find out about this trailer? Well, while technically all numbers on trailers are VINs, they're not what was considered a searchable VIN. A searchable VIN system was not established nationally in the, in the United States for travel trailers until 1981. That is when the 17 digit VIN system came to be. So first of all, when you go to the DMV, even if you have the legal paperwork, they may look at you like you're crazy if you only have you know, six, seven or five digits in your serial number. I've had trailers that have literally had three digits and they just look at me like I've lost my mind. <laughs> so remind them, hey, you know, if this is a pre-1981, it's not gonna have the 17 digit VIN system. You know, even if they type that into their system to search, it may come up as another vehicle or multiple vehicles because it was not a unique number back then. I had a trailer once that they ran the, the system in the national database and 79 other rigs came up with that same serial number. Everything from boats, cars, travel trailers. It was a nightmare, but I had to remind them this is a predates the searchable VIN. It's a serial number. Again, they'll probably call the supervisor if you haven't already called her over. She'll confirm. That'll make things go a little bit more smoothly. But just realize if you buy a trailer that you don't know what it is, you may not find out anything with serial number because it doesn't have anything coded. Some people will see in what looks like a year in the number. That's very, very unlikely, unfortunately. Just because it ends in a 5-4 or a 6-3, you know, that doesn't mean it's a year. I can tell you any serial number that is five numbers or less will never have a year in it. That's just how the series worked for any brand. Um, if it had more than five, there is a good chance if you see a two digit number spaced out, that's a 40, 50 or 60 if it's the kind of decade of your trailer, it may be, or it may be a coincidence. There was some crazy series that were used out there by different brands. So don't just assume that because you found the number that you can find out anything about it. And, a lot of people will say, oh, look on the front hitch. The front hitch is where it's going to be. That's where it's got to be. It may be very hard to find if it is there, but it may not be. Uh, I have a database of various brands of where they put their serial numbers. That list of locations is well over 50 locations. It's insane. Some of the crazy brands would put them in the most unusual places. Alma was very popular in the 40s and early 50s to put their serial number on top of the wheel well and then build the cabinets on top of it. There was a company called Travel Home. They literally stamped their serial number in the dead center of the ceiling on the top. Some put them inside the door. You have to open the door up to find it. So, I mean, you may not ever find the serial number and it may still be on your trailer. Um, some were crazy enough to do it on paper tags or metal tags. Those could have fallen off decades ago. So know that before you purchase a trailer. Hey, I need to make sure if it doesn't have the legal document, I know how to get it, I know the state laws, or I know where to find the serial number before. Don't just buy a trailer not knowing where the serial number is without paperwork and think, I get it home, then I'll search for the serial number. It may have fell off years ago. So just sure. know that up front. Tim, um, while you were talking about titles and um, Barbara typed in chat, she'd like you to explain a little more about what a bonded title is. A bonded title, those laws can vary by state too, but a bonded title, and I don't know a lot about them because we don't have that here in Florida for travel trailers, but a bonded title is where it's almost kind of like a promise title. You'll pay a fee to the state. They will give you a tag, and some states will give you a temporary registration, and it varies by state on how long of a waiting period. Sometimes it's just a year. Sometimes it's three years. Some states, it could be as long as three and seven years. And technically that trailer is kind of in limbo. It is your trailer legally. You do have a tag in your name that you pay a registration for every year. But if anybody comes forward and says that trailer's mine, here's the paperwork I have for it. Here's the serial number that matches. This is in my name or my family's estate name or it was stolen off of our property. And the police can prove that it was their trailer. You turn that trailer over to them in many cases, no compensation. 
you know, you may have spent 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars restoring that trailer. Somebody come forward, you kind of are out of that money. You have to turn it over because it legally belongs to them. Now, after that waiting period's over, then the state will send you a more permanent title or registration and tag, and it is legally yours. So it's a little bit of a gamble. It's a very unlikely situation that somebody may come forward, but there still is that chance. Excellent. Um, she thanks you and she got, by the way. Um, so you mentioned some states that are easy to work with and um, not so easy to work with. Uh, just based on your experience, what are the toughest states to deal with and what are the really simple states to, to work with? Florida is one of the absolute toughest, just because I think with the history of tin can tourist and tourism in Florida, there were so many hundreds of thousands of trailers coming to Florida so early on in the history of trailers, they had to create strict laws to begin with. So like I said, 1925 is when we started issuing titles for travel trailers, and that's very early. I mean, there was really not a lot of commercially built travel trailers at that time period. Uh, but some of the easy states, surprisingly, Alabama and Georgia are very easy. Alabama is probably the most easiest that I know. But again, that may be regional because I do live so close to the Alabama border and I deal with that state a lot. I do hear that California is pretty strict. I mean, they're kind of strict on pretty much anything. <laughs> right. But um, I don't know if it's still the case, but I do know California and some of the other West Coast company or states would um, make you pay back taxes, like registration fees and back taxes if a trailer was not kept up to date. So a trailer that may seem like a good deal for 500 bucks may have 10, 15, 20 years of back taxes that you owe for registration. So it makes it end up being a couple thousand dollar trailer versus a 500. So double check with your state and make sure they're not going to make you pay back taxes for a registration that was dormant or a title that was dormant. All right, I have um, one more question and then we'll see if uh, anyone- Well, I got one more topic too to, to cover. Okay. Um, so you mentioned um, throughout a lot of kind of common misinformation that's uh, posted on Facebook or in social media um, about this, this topic. Are there other things that kind of consistently come up that you just kind of shake your head and have to, you know, uh, put out the disclaimer on the TCT Facebook group? Right. The weight law that I mentioned is really the thing I'm seeing a lot right now because people are using the search feature on the state websites and just typing in trailer. So they're seeing the laws for trailer and not travel trailer. And I'm seeing that just increase like crazy, just even this week. Um, unfortunately, I had somebody here in Florida um, just yesterday that messaged me and said, hey, we just spent $12,000 on a Scotty, got no paperwork, not even a bill of sale. And they're like, but they told us the people we bought it from said it weighed under 2,500 pounds. We didn't need anything. Didn't even need a tag on the back. And now that they're trying to contact the DMV, DMV is telling them, I'm sorry, there's absolutely nothing else that you can do. You, you bought a beautiful yard fixture. So double check if you hear those, those weight laws. And even if you have a registration and you were told, you know, double check with your, you know, state laws and say, hey, I've got a registration for my travel trailer. Do travel trailers supposed to have a title? You know, and if they say no, if it's under a certain weight, ask to speak to the supervisor and make sure. Um, that's kind of been the big, big thing we've been seeing now. Um, about the only state that I know of that's probably the most laxed on their laws is Wisconsin. Wisconsin, believe it or not, and even on their state website says that you don't even have to have a tag, registration, or a title for any travel trailer. How they prove they own a rig, I have no idea in Wisconsin. But the one thing they do mention in Wisconsin is if you plan on traveling over the state line, come into the DMV and get a registration and get a tag. So it sounds like it's a very easy process in Wisconsin. So I don't know why you wouldn't do that anyway. Because again, if somebody says, that's my trailer, how are you going to prove with no paperwork? Um, so that, that was the only state that kind of surprised me that <laughs> you kind of pretty much do whatever you want to in Wisconsin with a trailer. But um, again, I would make sure you had something that proved that it was yours. Um, Barbara asked a question about vintage uh, license or vintage trailers and license plates. And I know states are different of whether you need a 
current license plate um, for your vintage trailer, or you can use a, you know, a license plate from that year and be able to get it registered. So she was asking specifically about California, whether or not you can do that. I don't know if you know the answer about California. I don't know the answer to California. The, the vintage year of date plates, depending on state laws. Um, I think in Michigan, you can use um, year of date tag. Here in Florida, we cannot on a travel trailer. You can on a car, but not a travel trailer, which makes no sense to me because we don't even have different tags for our travel trailers. It's actually the same tags for, um, for the cars. But um, so check with your state laws. Some states, like I know here in Florida for the cars, we have to have an original license plate year to date. We cannot restore the tag. It has to be an original condition. You send it to the state capitol. They confirm it. They send it back to you. And I think you can actually restore it after they confirm it. But then once you sell it to somebody else, they won't be able to use it because it has to be in an unrestored shape for them to confirm that it is an original tag. All right. Yeah, Michigan is similar where you don't have to send the actual vintage license plate. You have to send a photocopy of it. And I haven't heard of whether or not it can be restored or not. Um, so Because you're One sending in a we, photocopy, they probably wouldn't know. Right. One thing we do here in Florida, though, we'll, we can put a vintage year of date tag on our trailers and we just keep our new tags in the window. And like for me, it shows I'll just take that one out of the window for the show, put it back when I'm on the road. And you, you can do that. Um, another kind of little tip on that, too. When you get your trailer and you do have the paperwork or you need to go get the paperwork, you can go to your DMV, especially if it's a title state. And just get your trailer registered in your name. Because I'll do this a lot with my trailers because I work on everybody else's trailer. I don't get time to work on my own. So an unrestored trailer of my own may sit in the shop or sit in the backyard for three, four, five plus years with me not restoring it. I still want it legally in my name. So you can go in and pay the registration fee and just get the title in your name and not pay a registration. And I know our state will allow it and most states will that you can have it registered and just not pay the yearly fee for a new sticker on your tag. And that may save you a little bit of money. So don't just let the trailer sit if you know you're not going to work on it and not go ahead and put it in your name, because this kind of leads into the last topic I want to talk to is it needs to be in your name as soon as you take possession of it. Don't just sit on it and say, well, I may sell it without ever doing any work on it. And I'll just pass on the title or the registration to the next person and not pay the fees. Well, this is what's known in the industry as title jumping. And it is very, very illegal. It's also a kind of tax invasion because you're not paying the taxes that you owe the state for buying the trailer. And we see this happen a lot where somebody may bought a trailer, they didn't switch it over into their name because they knew they were going to flip it, sell it to somebody else. I've had people contact me before and say, hey, this trailer's been in the ownership of six, seven people. And you know, now the titles in somebody's name is deceased, or I can't get a hold of them. And the DMV says, you know, what am I going to do? I, I got to have, you know, the person I bought it from didn't legally own it. So make sure any title or any registration of a trailer you're buying is in the seller's name. And if it's not in their name, you need to tell them, hey, go to the DMV, get this in your name first, then I'll buy it from you. Surprisingly, in many states, skipping a title or title jumping is actually a felony so don't risk you know that type of being in trouble when it's just simple as you know getting the seller go ahead and put it in your name then i'll take the title and that way it's a legal process so just make sure all the paperwork is legit it's in the name and that way you know they legally have the right to sell it to you you legally have the right to buy and you'll have no problems so you know, I hope some of this has helped with terminology and how the correct words to ask for, ask for a travel trailer information, not a trailer. And um, the best advice I can give is having a registration and or title, you will never have an issue. So, you know, that's a big gamble to take unless you're absolutely 100% sure in your title laws in your state. Awesome, thanks Tim. Um, before we get a look at your trailer that's behind you, was there any other questions online or in your audience, I guess? 
Oh no, I've already filled them in all all week. Oh, what Mark's got a question. I'm not advocating it, but you know, first thing I start thinking, I'm wondering, I'd have trouble getting the title or the registration. What if I could take it to another state that's really easy? Do it back in the right. Mark's asking about title in a state or title in a trailer through another state. Most of your states are going to require you to be a resident of that state in order to register our title. Now, if you've got property in that state, then you may be able to go that route. Um, there are one or two states that do not require you to be a resident. I can't remember if one of them, but the other one is Vermont. Vermont is a state that you can register your trailer without being a resident there. I guess they're probably one of the smart states because they're getting your tax money, <laughs> regardless, <laughs> regardless of where you live at. But yeah. But um, some states are really cracking down on that, that if you are a resident of their state and you can't prove that you live in that state, it's kind of putting a little bit of a red flag. Um, I will admit I have gone through Vermont, Vermont for a title once because um, they don't issue titles. They issue registrations, but Florida will recognize a registration. And when I went to the DM in Florida, a law had changed where they were, it was going to change, where they were wanting proof of some sort of mail or something in my name from Vermont. So I don't know if those laws have changed correctly, if she was telling me the right information. So just be cautious. Don't think, oh, I can go to another state and get a title and then I'll be fine. So just the important thing is knowing all of your information beforehand and also be aware state laws can change daily. I deal with the Florida DMV here almost on a weekly basis and they're the, be the first ones to admit, I've got to go check, even though you're in here that often, you people just don't know how much the laws will change and shift every single day and she said that's why we get so aggravated because we can't keep up with everything so just know before you before you purchase <laughs> all right i'm going to take the um quiet as you've covered everything um and we would love to see um, your trailer, your 1959 Ellsworth. I do have, so I have a bit of trivia for you. Do you know um, what the village of Ellsworth and your trailer is named after? I have no clue. <laughs> so I didn't either until I tried to remember where Ellsworth was because I pass through it every spring on the way to uh, fishing at Charlevoix Lake. There's it's about a mile long. It's a tiny little town. I don't know how they could even have a trailer manufacturer. Um, uh, so oh, that village a, was named a after a colonel a uh, who was the first uh, Union officer killed in the Civil War. His name was Ephraim Elmer Ellsworth. So three E's, E-E-E, uh -huh. e -E -E, triple E. Yep. All right, so uh, take us on a little tour. All right, I'm going to try to turn this camera around. Let's see. Okay. You got it. You got it. All right. This is the 1959 Ellsworth. They did not build these very long at all. They, they built two models. They built a 14 foot model, and then this one is the 11 foot model that does count the front hitch. It probably has about a seven and a half foot long body. It's about six foot two wide, six foot two, six foot two height inside. And the floor space is probably also six foot two. So it's about a cube on wheels. It's got just about everything you could want. The booth makes into a nice comfortable bed. Does not have a bathroom, but it had an ice box. I did change that out to a fridge. Little vintage cook stove top and then a sink. And of course I got a little creative and it actually has 14,000 BTUs of a ducted central air conditioning system, which vents out here. So no ugly modern unit to be seen anywhere inside or even outside. I did cheat a little bit. Usually I like to keep my trailers original, but um, they were not the best built trailers. They had an all masonite interior that was painted with a very hideous looking splatter paint, including the cabinets and the walls. But it just had that really cool 50s vintage look, so I had to do a birch interior. But it is the original floor plan. 
And then I got a little creative on the outside. And this is a little bit of a dying art. This is actually automotive paint. This is not a decal. And it was very common in the 70s with the low riders um, out in Southern California. They would use, actually it's, you literally use fabric lace to create this pattern. And they would do lace paint jobs on their hoods and trunks and the cabs of the top. So I kind of wanted to add that nice little touch to it. Tim, I it, remember when you, um, I think it was the oddest question we had seen from you <laughs> a year or so ago when you were asking for vintage lace patterns. <laughs> well, it was hard to find a lace that was not real floral or looked like I ripped up a wedding dress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I happened to walk into, we have a big Super Joann's down here. It's massive. And they had a little bit of this fabric. And when I saw it, I was like, I got to have it. But they only had two yards of it. <laughs> was that stenciled? And I, you stenciled? Well, did, you, did you stencil that? So you put the fabric over the siding and then you sprayed? Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's a very, very, very tough technique because you have to have the correct pressure. You got to have the correct angle. It, it took me about a month or two to really kind of perfect, and I still haven't really perfected it, but it turned out really great, and it's got that really unique look, and um, it's definitely turning heads when I travel through towns. <laughs> Tim, where did you so, find the trailer? I know you've had it for a couple years. Oh, I've had it for about 10 years, but unfortunately, it's been shoved in the corner for <laughs> a long time, but... Um, it was a local trailer. It was sitting on the side of the road in Panama City Beach, right on the beach. Of course, it was about rusted out and rotten. And I had to pull it about 10 miles home. And I really don't know what kept it from collapsing because it was only $400. And I probably paid $400 too much since it was the shape that it was in. But um, it just was so unique. I really didn't even know what it was at the time because they did not have any decals or any emblems. The only thing was a very small, tiny metal tag welded to the frame that just said Ellsworth coach on it. And thankfully I was able to do a little research and find out that it was built by a steel company up in Michigan. Um, and they actually were a steel sided trailer, um, but I, I did change out steel to aluminum. It still looks the same. You couldn't tell any difference. Um, the only difference would have been, I didn't want to worry about every scratch or every nick rusting. So that's why I went back with aluminum but it's the same skin profile. Of course, had to have the white walls. So, and it's definitely, as, as you can see, it's backwards in the site because once I unhook, I can move it by hand. <laughs> and that way I'm facing Alex over here and her beautiful little 65 aristocrat. So we've had a great showing here at the rally. We're gonna try to work with the park and see if we can't get them here next year and if you would pull one of your trailers down there is some really nice bass fishing they've got <laughs> lakes it's called twin lakes because there's two lakes that are divided by a dam and what's really great about this park it's kind of two big horseshoes of sites so even if you're on the inner horseshoe you still have a waterfront view over the trailers on the lower horseshoe so we get you down here next year we can do some bass fishing <laughs> that sounds great oh i did have a question about your fish fry last night what was yes. the uh what what types of fish were people able to uh, enjoy a wide variety of saltwater fish my family does a little bit more saltwater fishing bay fishing than we do uh freshwater we had speckled trout redfish mahi mahi black drum um flounder uh uh, mangrove snapper, red snapper. They had a wide variety. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. I think people should come to your rallies just for the fish fry, I think. <laughs> we fed um, about 60 last night. <laughs> uh, Donald App and Marsha would like to hear a little bit about your AC unit that you installed in there and how it works. Unfortunately, that's a little bit of a trade secret. So I'm, I'm sorry with that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, uh, so I know on Facebook, people were asking, how does this little tiny trailer tow? 
um, what kind of tongue weight it has. And I was a little um, worried about that because it is such small and I kind of call it the world's smallest full size trailer. Because when you get to this size of trailers, they're usually either teardrops or they're trailers with little drop down floors that you can only stand up in one place. This trailer has full six foot three head height throughout it, but it's so short. And I worried about that. But thankfully, Ellsworth was smart enough to design it with the front kitchen in the front. So it does have a good amount of tongue weight and it pulled with no problems. So I was I was really pleased because I was worried about it being very light and squirrely on the road. But mm -hmm. she did. So they made a model that was a little bit larger than, than that. Was it the same? Um, design and style or different layouts yes it was the exact same style and pretty much the same layout except it had a much bigger booth that we would make into a larger bed it was almost the bed was more lengthwise instead of instead of across the back and had a little bit more closet space in it but, um, there was a, there's only been one or two others of these surface but both of those have been completely rotted away one was in Oregon, but it didn't even have the chassis under it. Somebody had picked up the body, put it in the backyard as a shed, and it was collapsing. So it just was, uh, I don't think many of these have survived over the years. Do you, how many years did they make? So was 59 the first year or was this? Uh... 59 was the first and only year. They only built them for a few months. Um, I have not been able to find a connection, but there was a company in Colorado called Colorado Mobile Homes. In about 1961, they added a travel trailer line and it's called the Ellsworth. It's called the Colorado Ellsworth and it uses the same serial number series. So the only thing I can think of is either Colorado Mobile Homes purchased the name for a travel trailer or somebody from the company, you know, took the the brand with them and created, you know, or either merged with another company, but I've still been researching that but there's definitely got to be connection because they use the exact same serial number numbers and, and letters. So this sounds very similar to like a holiday house kind of situation where um, company, you know, decided that they would make a trailer during their off time. Um, were you able, is that similar to this where this was a steel company and they said, Hey, let's put some workers to use for a little bit and make a trailer it for a was year. A little bit. That. they didn't they weren't in a, a lull or anything like that they um just you know the 50s was really the boom of the trailer was the second boom of the trailer industry and so they um they just added their own trailer division to build trailers um unfortunately they got a lot of government contracts and the government came in and did a surprise inspection on their steel and called them using inferior steel and charging for premium steel so they kind of messed up with the government and there was some massive lawsuits. So that may have really kind of shut the trailer business down. <laughs> All right, Tim, I really appreciate you taking the time today um, away from your rally and your hosting duties to show us your trailer and answer all the questions for us. No problem. All right, I think uh, we have hit uh, two o'clock exactly this was perfect thank you very much thank uh everyone that joined and uh we'll make uh this video available online and recording uh, hopefully i'll get that out um later this week sure no problem thanks all right thanks tim bye everybody